Well, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Brown, and I'm the program director of the Science of Learning Research Initiative, SOLAIR, of the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation. And I'm very pleased to have the opportunity today to tell you about the Provost SOLAIR Seed Grants, this program that we <clears throat> launched last year to support um, faculty research projects in scholarship of teaching and learning. And uh, we're going to be expanding it and continuing it this year. And I'm very excited to tell you about that <laughs> expansion. Sorry, give me one second. <clears throat> um, anyways, uh, I want to introduce myself uh, just for a moment at the beginning, because I think it will make Solaire make more sense to you. So I have a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Chicago. And while I was a graduate student, I got very interested in the scholarship of teaching and learning. I was a graduate fellow at the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning at UChicago. And I knew after I finished my PhD that I wanted to work in scholarship of teaching and learning in higher education. And when I had the opportunity to apply for this position with Solaire, I knew it was uh, the perfect opportunity to combine my scientific perspective, my perspective as a scientific researcher with my interest in teaching and learning. So that's really the core of what Solaire is about, combining the research perspective with questions about uh, students' learning experiences in higher education. And today uh, we're gonna hear from two faculty members who have collaborated with Solaire over the past year, Brent Stockwell and Alfredo Spagna. So we'll start off talking about the origins of Solaire, then about this amazing faculty advisory committee that uh, helps guide Solaire, as well as our key partnerships around the university. We'll talk about this thing called DBER, Discipline-Based Education Research, what it is and why it's important. Then we'll talk about the Provost Solaire Seed Grants Program, our main focus today. And then I'll answer a question that many of you may have, which is what about IRB, the Institutional Review Board? Um, if you're not sure what that is, we'll talk about it soon. Uh, then we'll talk about what's coming up next for Solaire. What, what are our future plans and how are we gonna grow? And lastly, we'll hear from the two uh, faculty um, guests that we have today, Brent Stockwell and Alfredo Spagna. They'll talk about their projects that they've worked on with Solaire over the past year. And we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. So to understand where Solaire begins, we have to go back to 2014 when this uh, organization called the Provost Faculty Committee on Educational Innovation convened and recommended establishing two organizations. One, the Center for Teaching and Learning, which was established in 2015. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the CTL and all of the amazing work that they do. Um, they've grown uh, rapidly over the past six years and become such a, a major force for uh, improving teaching and learning at Columbia. And then to complement the CTL, uh, this committee recommended the creation of a research center devoted to building capacity in the learning sciences. So a key excerpt from that report said that teaching itself should become an object of research, ideally in collaboration with learning scientists and educational researchers. So Solaire, the Science of Learning Research Initiative, was established to be a vibrant hub for cross-disciplinary research that advances the scholarship of teaching and learning. So again, that intersection of the research process and SOTL, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And Solaire was established in 2018 and became fully operational last year, around the time that I joined as the program director. So Solaire is advised by a faculty committee, which is chaired by Suleiman Kachani, who is the vice provost uh, for teaching, learning, and innovation, and by Janet Metcalf, uh, professor of psychology as well as about a dozen other faculty members from across the university representing many of the different schools and departments. So as I alluded to earlier, Solaire and CTL are kind of like siblings under the BPTLI, and Solaire team is rather small at the moment and may grow in the future, um, but it consists of me, the program director, um, Sandesh Tuladar, who is assistant provost for online education, and Meryl Norton, who is the assistant director of online education. And Solaire collaborates with a number of important offices around the university, the Office of Research Compliance and Training, the Institutional Review Board, uh, which we work with in developing umbrella protocols. We'll talk more about that later. The Office of General Counsel, and of course, CUIT, because doing education research entails the collection of sensitive data. And so we work with CUT on collection, storage, and data compliance protocols. So let's turn our attention to the this concept of discipline-based education research, DBR, and talk about what it is and why it's important. So as I said earlier, it is the formal research approach to SOTL. So what is SOTL? SOTL is, and we can use this Venn diagram to sort of understand how these different concepts fit together. SOTL is the intersection of the advancement of teaching and learning in higher education 
and particular disciplinary content, meaning learning objectives and skills and ideas that students are, are learning in the context of particular courses and, 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 and uh, majors. So SOTL is that intersection in black. And then when we take SOTL, which is quite a broad, diverse phenomenon, many different ways to approach the scholarship of teaching and learning, we take that and combine it with the methodologies and the frameworks of social science research, social science, because we're talking about human behavior, human cognition, we have the intersection of all three, which is DBR. So another way of thinking about it is that education research is what you get when you combine teaching and learning advancement with social science research. And when you take that education research and place it within the context of a particular discipline, you get DBR. So for more uh, explanation of this kind of Venn diagram framework, you are invited to check out the Solaire faculty guide. And I think um, we'll drop the link to that page in the chat. And this is a repository of big picture ideas and best practices and resources for DBR um, that Solaire put together. And it's a work in progress. So if you have any, if you check it out, and you have feedback, I'd be really happy to hear from you. So let's think about why we would want to engage in this kind of work. Well, we've always had a lot of motivation to, to want to understand what works best for our students' learning. But maybe right now, there's more, more, devotion, more motivation than ever because of the shift to remote learning. We're in a new paradigm, and it's very crucial to try to understand, well, what can we do to best support our students' learning experiences? But how would we know what works best for our students' learning? One approach, and this is kind of the core DBR method, is to do an experiment where you compare two pedagogical approaches, method A and method B. Which one of these two methods will lead to better learning and attitude outcomes? Well, if other variables are controlled, meaning that the only difference between the two groups is the method, A versus B, then we can actually make a causal inference, right? This is kind of a core idea of the scientific method, that if the only difference between two groups is one particular variable, method A or method B, then we can infer that any differences in the outcomes for those two groups are caused by the difference in method. So that's kind of the idea of applying that core scientific principle to SOTL. And will this, this kind of leads us to a question of, will we have from this universal insights about learning, sort of fundamental insights into the learning process? Well, the truth is that learning is a very, very context dependent process context dependent because of idiosyncrasies in particular professors, in particular courses, in institutions. So context matters a great deal. This means that maybe we don't get sort of generalizable universal insights about the learning process from this work. However, that's actually more of a feature than a bug, I would argue, because our focus is intentionally narrow. We want to know about the learning process that is going on in this course, in this particular institutional context, academic context. And the real results that we want are most relevant to that context and can be used to inform the next iteration of the course. So if we're getting information about the learning experience in this particular context, which we can use to inform the next iteration of the course. And this iterative process, if we incorporate small experiments into each iteration, we can gradually build a much stronger course. So over time, doing these experiments, we can build a better and better course. So to support this DBR process, we created the Provost Solaire C Grants Program to facilitate and support DBR at Columbia. The goal is to better understand and improve teaching and learning in Columbia courses by doing two things. One, developing and empirically testing the impact of innovative pedagogical interventions. That's that experimental model that I described on the previous slide. And also by devising and or implementing learning analytics procedures. This is more on the side of the kind of big data, data science um, approach where, for example, you're collecting lots and lots of data on student engagement with digital platforms like Canvas. And then we have this wealth of data and we try to mine it for insights, patterns. And note that you can actually combine these two methods, right? You can do experiments where you're manipulating some element of the, of the student experience uh, with the platform and then you're looking at the data generated um, through that engagement. So they're not mutually exclusive at all. Um, and these projects are driven by faculty PIs, which could be in some cases interdisciplinary teams of faculty. And this is really crucial because it's emphasizing the idea that the whole inquiry, the question about students learning is grounded in the disciplinary expertise or interdisciplinary in some cases 
of the faculty members. The questions are about addressing specific learning objectives and it's the expertise that the faculty have in the discipline that anchors the whole enterprise, right? That expertise gives insight into what is it that students need to learn in this particular context and how can they learn it? So this is the D in DBR, the discipline. And to support these projects, um, at this time, it's only a modest amount of funding, but extensive in-kind support. So that support involves framing the research objectives and matching the study designs to the specific aims, developing or refining methods of assessment or measurement, devising methods for data analysis and visualization, preparing materials for IRB approval. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And developing a plan to disseminate findings, usually in the form of publications and conference presentations. And as a secondary goal, we hope that these projects will provide pilot data for major external grant applications from organizations like the NSF or the Institute for Education Science. So think about this idea of a seed grant. Well, what are we trying to plant? We're trying to plant something that will grow into an ongoing line of inquiry. And the best way to support that ongoing inquiry is with not just continued support from Solaire, but the enhanced resources that would come along with a, a major external grant. So we hope that some of these projects will grow into these kind of major um, lines of inquiry with external support. But some of you are thinking, well, what about the IRB? So the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, is an organization that exists at Columbia and at every, uh, every university um, to review all human subjects research, to make sure that any, any research study that involves uh, humans, involves people, um, is adhering to certain protocols and regulations that are mandated by the government. And most DBR projects are subject to what's called exempt review from the IRB. Um, however, don't let that term fool you. This is human subject research, so it's not exempt um, from review. It must be registered with the IRB, but this, what they call exempt review, um, it's, a very, it's a very simple process. Um, only a simple consent form is needed. And in the case of archive data, if you're looking at data that came from you know, years ago, uh, students participation courses years ago, you wouldn't even need that consent process. And the review is conducted by one IRB staff member, um, which is a very fast review process. Some projects might be pushed into what's called the expedited category instead. Um, it's a more extensive consent form process. Um, the review is conducted by an IRB committee member, not the full convened committee. So it's a little bit uh, slower review process, but still um, much quicker than uh, the full convened committee process. And some factors that would push a project into that category would be collection of physiological or physical data like electroencephalography data, which we'll actually talk about a little later today, um, or the data not being de-identified for any reason, or if there's a risk of breach of confidentiality, which could be due, for example, to a, a very small class size. Um, if you're doing this research in a very small seminar, it might not be possible to protect the anonymity of the students because it would be too easy to match up the data to the individuals. Um, again, that's all right, but that would probably push things into the expedited category. Um, and one major thing that IRB is concerned about that you need to know um, is that in all cases, students have the option to exclude their data from disseminated analysis, right? Every student will be given the option to say, I do not want the data that I generate through my participation in this course to be part of any kind of publication or conference presentation. However, students may or may not have the option to opt out of the study activities themselves. That depends on whether the study activities entail something that is outside of the scope of the normal um, activities of the course, right? So if students are being asked, if, if participating in the study entails uh, an extra session, which will be the case in one of the projects that we're talking about today, um, they could opt out of that. But if, the, if being in the study just means being in the course, um, then they would not have the opportunity to opt out unless they want to drop the class. So let's talk a little bit about Solaris next steps. Where are we going from here? Well, one major area is collaboration with the CTL on select projects. We've actually already established something of a model for a project being supported simultaneously by a PSSG and by one of the provost teaching and learning grants. That's the case with Brent Stockwell's project, uh, which you'll hear about very soon. But we want to establish more of a formal protocol for this kind of collaboration where faculty could be applying for both in parallel and there'd be a really clear structured system for CTL and PS and Solaire to, to collaborate on support for the project. So that's something we are developing now. Um, additionally, we're going to expand our services in several key ways. First of all, 
um, we talked about the IRB. What we want to do is create umbrella protocols. So kind of create a set of different sort of uh, models of projects, right? Certain like uh, recurring themes in how the projects are structured so that we can fast track the IRB approval process by saying, okay, this project fits into model A. So it's gonna be a very quick approval process. So we already have approval for model A uh, projects. And um, we're also working on developing a learning management system, learning analytics dashboard. So we, I alluded to earlier this idea of learning analytics where you're collecting lots and lots of data from student engagement with digital platforms. Uh, this is the case across the university with Canvas and with other platforms like Panopto. So we're working now with CUIT and with the Academic Technologies Leadership Group, ATLG, on developing this dashboard tool, which will allow faculty to quickly get access to important insights um, that they can use um, in, in conjunction with this kind of DBR process, right? So kind of making the learning analytics data more accessible and useful for faculty. So kind of building these general tools that can be widely used. And uh, the thing that I'm most excited about is the creation of the Solaire Fellows Program, which we hope will be coming to focus very soon. And uh, we know that DBR is sort of a, a type of social science research. And not all faculty are going to have the relevant skills, depending on what departments they're coming from. So students, uh, whether they would be grad, uh, undergraduates, advanced undergrads, or, or graduate students who have that relevant expertise can do a great deal to enhance the research effort. So the support roles that these students would be providing would overlap with Solaire services, things like designing the research methodologies um, and, in, and assessment instruments, um, as well as data analysis, um, more coordinating logistical type work, um, all of that can do a great deal to enhance the project. And it's a win-win because for these students, uh, involvement in DVR will broaden their training and may lead to publications, which of course is great for students. And I think most importantly, this kind of involvement builds the DVR community. It establishes ties between departments and Solaire, promotes the idea of DVR as, as, a, as an important and worthwhile and, and fruitful activity um, that faculty can engage with and administrative staff can support and students can be part of as well. And uh, these students will, these fellows will be compensated, uh, but that money won't have anything to do with the award funds for the PSSG itself. It would be a separate allocation. So a little more on the idea of building community and outreach. Uh, we're also going to establish a journal club to promote literacy in the field of DBR. So we'll have occasional meetings um, to discuss uh, one or two peer reviewed articles and participants um, would be the Solaire faculty committee, of course, as well as um, anyone who's applying or has been awarded a PSSG uh, people in the CTL uh, and others involved in uh, digital community at Columbia and ATLG, et cetera. So administrative folks as well. And we'll have more information about this coming soon. Uh, so next we're going to hear from the first of our two uh, faculty um, guests. The first uh, will be Brent Stockwell, who uh, has a joint appointment. He's a professor of biological sciences and chemistry. He's a member of the Motor Neuron Center and the Cancer Research Center. and uh, most importantly, he's a member of the Solaire faculty committee, um, which I mentioned earlier. And so he's, he's been with Solaire since the beginning. And he's published work in uh, DBR. He's published articles of his own DBR research already, um, uh, including in the journal Cell, which is a very high impact biology journal, which I, again, I think emphasizes the idea of uh, the disciplinary grounding of this kind of work. And the fact that the DBR work he's done is of interest to the biology community. Um, he's also won numerous awards and uh, published many articles in his discipline, of course, and also uh, was the recipient of the LenFest Distinguished Faculty Award for Excellence in Teaching. So um, thank you so much, Brent Stockwell, for joining us, and uh, we'll continue now with, with your presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Adam, for that very kind introduction. So it's great to see everyone here interested in solar and uh, education research and teaching. So yeah, I just wanted to give you a relatively quick overview of the project that we did and we're continuing on this this summer and then into the fall as well. But we, we started looking at uh, virtual reality and whether that would be useful for teaching biochemistry. And actually originally, the, my thought was that in a, in a remote situation, it would create more of a sense of presence and being with students, sitting around, talking about biochemistry, more like what we experienced sitting in my office in, in the old days, in the before times. And, 
but what we've learned, as you'll see, is that the, the illustrating or illuminating 3D aspects of biochemistry, I think, is going to be one of the uh, important things that we can do in VR, in addition to presence, you know, and actually having more of a presence. So what we've done so far is uh, last summer we started laying the foundation and applied for the, the Solar Award and one of the Provost Awards to start thinking about how to do this. And, you know, there's a lot of <clears throat> groundwork I won't go through in, in figuring everything out, but basically finding the right platform, the hardware, the software, and then what, what could we do in virtual reality that would be beneficial. Uh, and then in the fall, we actually implemented it. So we, we recruited students to the study. We offered, it was voluntary recruitment. We offered them a small uh, gift card compensation if they participated and they had to, if they, if they participated, they would be randomized to the VR or the Zoom groups. And then we would do, a, they'd have to do a survey at the end and they'd have to agree to participate as much as they can. Obviously if they drop out, there's nothing we can do. Uh, I was kind of surprised that the number of people who, who joined was less than we thought, uh, who joined the study. I think in the end, um, it was about 20, 15 in each group or, or so. So, and the class size was about a hundred students. So, mo you know, more students didn't join the study than did. And so I think in, in talking to students and try to understand that, I think one aspect was just the scheduling, like a lot of students were not free at the time. Um, so that's anyways, so these are all kind of lessons learned and things to think about for the future, but the, the scheduling always turns into to be a big issue. Um, we, yeah, I mean, my, my thought was that the, this, there might be more satisfaction um, and there might, be potentially a benefit in terms of like three-dimensional concepts. And I think what we learned in the study was that um, there's, there is a learning curve with virtual reality. So the students who, who did the, or ended up randomized into the VR group rated actually the technology as requiring more of a training and, and learning than they did on Zoom, which, you know, I guess makes sense. Everyone's familiar with Zoom at this point. So that led us now for this summer to actually have uh, training modules. Oh, here's a, a demo I can show you. Of, oh, uh, yeah, actually, why, why don't we watch the video and then we'll then we'll talk yeah, about. Yeah, let me uh, show you an example of what it what it looks like. Go ahead. Yeah. So this was the first platform we used, which was spatial, where we could import 3D structures or molecules or any really 3D objects. And then there's my avatar. You can see I'm. This is we're, you're looking at the student point of view, and we're looking at this protein together, and we're moving around it, and we're talking about different aspects of the three-dimensional structure. And I can zoom it and make it much bigger, and everyone in the room can look at it together, and uh, again walk around and talk. And we're in a desert amphitheater there, like kind of just enjoying the vista while we talk about these things. I think there's one more video you have. Yeah, okay, here's one where you can see now I gave everyone their own protein. And so each student can actually manipulate their own protein. And that ended up actually being a lot better because they started to get much a better sense of what I was talking about when they had their own model to work with rather than just looking at a model in the middle of the room. So that's, again, these are all like little lessons about how to do this better. Um, yeah, I think some of the insights are, are shown here. So basically um, getting a high quality 3D, we, we spent a lot of time figuring that out, but basically now we know how to generate uh, protein structures in a way that they can be imported and render them in particular ways to highlight different features. And that the students, in, at least in their surveys, indicated was the most valuable piece, really like looking at proteins, which are for them very complicated things and like to really see it in three dimensions was, it, it seemed at least intuitively impactful. You know, we still need to evaluate like the impact in a quantitative way, but, um, and uh, yeah, and, and that's also part of the challenge is that, you know, I've always taught in two dimensions. So I didn't really have questions that specifically went into 3D aspects of protein function. I had no way to teach that really. So now I have to think about what can I, 
ask and what kind of probing questions can we can we give them that get into that more deeper understanding, which you don't want it to just be intuitive. We want to try to measure that in a way, but that, that's another challenge. Um, and then the, the, the immersion aspect of really feeling like you're there in spatial, the first platform, the software, you know, that we used, it didn't have animated avatars. So it sort of felt a little bit static. It didn't have the same presence I was expecting, but now we have a new platform called glue that we're using this summer. Uh, we're trying to finalize that and there the avatars are animated and so when you're talking your eyes are moving your eyebrows your mouth like your your hands you're gesticulating you really feel like you're there with someone and also the audio the volume depends on how close they are to you and there's directionality so it's much more like you're in a space with another person or a group of people talking um, there were a couple of issues that came up in the surveys with the students one was that it can get uncomfortable wearing the headset for a while is kind of heavy so that's one of the reasons we went now with the new headsets the quest 2 is, is quite a bit lighter and more comfortable than the original oculus quest and so for me at least that makes a big difference and it's a lot more comfortable and then they also they wanted to be able to take notes in vr but of course they can't do that because they don't have their computers so we worked out a way to do note taking that we're going to try for this summer which is towards the end of the session, everyone takes off their headset, goes to a shared Google Doc. We've got it set up for them to enter notes in a particular section. And then we all come back into VR and we go over the shared doc in VR and then they have that as a takeaway. So they actually can, can capture the content from that session. Um, and so, yeah, those are, we're, we're still trying to bring in other things like live polling for this summer. Um, we're going to have, as I said, some training sessions. So I think still a lot of the focus is on getting the platform right, getting the technological pieces there. But then we also want to do another uh, evaluation and, and have a, a, a test that specifically probes some of the kind of three-dimensional pieces that we hope they would be getting from this. So I think that's what we had. Is there was there another slide, Adam, or not? That's it for the slides. So what, what I'm going to do now is spend a few minutes uh, just asking Brent a few questions of my own, and then we'll have time at the end of the session today for general Q and A. So if you have questions for Brent, uh, we'll have time for that at the end. Um, but Brent, um, first of all, thanks for that that great summary of the project. Uh, it is really exciting what we've accomplished so far and how much we have planned for the future now. Um, starting very soon with summer A in just a few weeks. Um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what Solaire did specifically to support this project um, last fall and in, in the developmental period in the summer. Yeah, yeah, Solaire was really key and, and working with Adam, I can tell everyone was key because there was thinking through the strategy of how to implement it, how to evaluate it, how to survey students getting the IRB done. I mean, I had done IRBs before, but it always takes just a bit of legwork. And you know, as always, there's a million things to do. And, and Adam was able to really make that happen. And then writing up the report and evaluating it. So I feel like it, it was the missing piece that if we didn't have that, it just might have never kind of made it to ignition to really uh, be and, and not and to have been evaluated in a rigorous way. So. Great, yeah, and I also want to emphasize that this project uh, was supported last year and continues to be supported this year um, by the Emerging Technologies Consortium, which is a collaboration of CUIT and the libraries. It's a really fantastic involvement from Parixit Deve and Madiha Choksi, uh, two members of, e of Emerging Tech, and uh, uh, really great support both in the development of the, of the overall ideas and goals of the project, as well as a lot of the technical elements. So it's really a great um, collaborative team that we have. Um, Brent, can you tell us a little bit more about your vision for how this project could be scaled up or sort of applied um, in other contexts in your departments, biology and chemistry, and then maybe even more broadly at the university? Yeah, yeah. I think that it's the two potentially useful features are this idea of, of presence, of being present with people more so than, you know, all of us here on Zoom. Uh, avoids also the camera issue of are you going to you know be your own videographer you need the lighting you need the backdrop you need all this stuff 
it's, you know, VR, you just got your avatar, you're there, you don't have to set anything up, you don't have to worry about any of that. So, and, and then you feel like you are there with other people. So to the extent that that would be beneficial for like office hours or short meetings with students, you don't want them to travel all the way to campus or you're not able to, then I think it could generally be useful. But then the other really unique thing is the 3D objects, being able to bring in 3D objects. So I think anyone who has 3D data sets or you know, 3D um, aspects to what they're teaching could you know, potentially that those would be places where this would be useful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have some experience teaching um, you know, intro biology concepts myself, and I can imagine how useful this would be for students learning things like DNA replication and uh, transcription and translation. All, all of those are have a very you know, spatial 3D element to them, and I can see how that would really enhance the learning experience. So I think there's a lot of upside for how VR could be expanded, you know, especially in the sciences and maybe in beyond. We talked a little bit about architecture and other disciplines um, where that kind of 3D spatial environments uh, is really crucial to the learning experience. So maybe on that note, you can tell us a little bit more about these targeted assessments that we're trying to develop for this next iteration. Tell us a little bit more about what exactly is this sort of 3D element that students need to master in biochemistry and how can that match with the virtual reality experience? Yeah, it's so a, a good example is uh, I, I do teach this every year and, and students always struggle with it. So in the, some of you may remember from your biochemistry, the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, uh, there's, a, there's a step in that cycle where you're going from citrate to isocitrate, it's two metabolites. And the, the reaction always the isomerization it always goes in one direction on the molecule. The citrate looks like it's symmetric, but actually the enzyme always moves the, does the isomerization onto one side of the molecule, not the other side. And students are always puzzled by that because they're like, it, it's a symmetric molecule, it should be random. And then I can just tell them the answer for that. And then they're like, okay, okay, I, I got that one, but they don't understand the deeper principle there which is that when citrate is bound to the enzyme, it's in a chiral environment and the enzyme can actually control that directionality. So that's one of my goals is to be able to basically take a scenario where they, uh, they don't understand a, an aspect of a mechanism and show them now on, okay, here's the molecule, here's it's bound, this is the movement we're talking about, this is how the enzyme controls it, this is why it can be done asymmetrically. And now hopefully rather than just knowing that one fact, they'd be able to generalize from that to other contexts where, okay, I see anytime you have this type of situation, I would expect that this could be done in an asymmetric fashion. Um, and then the, then the challenge in evaluating that is you've got to think of questions that test that more generalized understanding. So that's, you know, it's just a lot that has to go into thinking of these evaluation questions. Yeah, it's certainly a really fascinating uh, issue. And I think, you know, just getting the chance to hear you talk in depth about those learning objectives is really exciting because it again emphasizes the idea of the, of the disciplinary expertise and the disciplinary context being such a huge motivator for the work that we're doing, right? We're, we're interested in how students learn not just in general, but how they learn specific concepts, how they master the specific skills. And um, we can see how the disciplinary expertise of the professor um, is really such a, a powerful driving force um, for the whole enterprise. So thanks very much, Brent. Um, and again, we'll have some time for Q&A with Brent uh, at the end of the session. Um, our next guest is Alfredo Spagna, who is a lecturer in the discipline of psychology and the director of undergraduate studies in neuroscience and behavior. And Alfredo is a, a cognitive neuroscientist who's interested in the intersection of, co of cognitive neuroscience and education. So he's really interested in bridging the apparent divide between uh, the laboratory and the classroom. So Alfredo is also working on a project with Solaire and I'm very pleased to introduce him and to give him the opportunity to tell us about that work that he is doing. So uh, thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, Adam. And can you all hear me well? I can hear you. Okay, awesome. So once again, thank you so much, Adam and Soler, for um, having me today here. 
Um, first of all, I will just you know say that what, what Brent just said, and I think that the statement holds absolutely true and is whatever you need, Adam will do it. He will solve it and he's able to do everything. So um, I really, really would like to start by saying that working with solar has been so interesting and enriching. We have this idea, I'm going to tell you very briefly what we are going to do. So I have less data, more the, the, the idea is um, the course we're going to do is going to be delivered and fall. But um, really, really, really working with, with Adam especially, but also we have had help from Janet Metcalf and solar in general is just an enriching uh, experience to really think through how you can make your a course have a research component and really study what happens in our case, what happens in the student's brain as they are learning. So um, um, this is this course. So once again, thank you again, Solar, for this opportunity. Uh, this course is kind of or the idea of this course is can be summarized into one statement, which is what happens in the student's brain, in a student's brain when they are studying the brain. So what happens in the brain when you are studying neuroscience? So, and this is the circular approach, the circular idea is what really, uh, what we wanted to do and what we're trying to, to do with this uh, innovative course. So of course I cannot be, do this by myself. So I'm working with Xiao Fu He, who is an assistant professor in clinical neuro, of clinical neurobiology at UIMC. And this grant is supported by SOLAR, but also by uh, ADSI, Data Science Institute Collaboratory Grant, put together by Caroline Marvin uh, for our department um, uh, a year ago. And uh, the idea is, is the collaboratory grant is very big. And in particular, SOLAR is, is helping us uh, refine the methodology of what we want to do in class, which um, is represented here uh, on the figure on the right. I'm going to annotate a little bit. I like to annotate on the slides. So the course is called Fundamentals of Human Brain Imaging and um, somehow is going to be um, delivered in fall 2021 uh, if it's possible for face-to-face -face instruction. What we're going to do is um, we're going to ask our uh, 12 students, so you see we have 12 students uh, in our seminar course to um, take a regular neuroimaging course. During the neuroimaging course, we're going to teach them how to um, collect and analyze data, especially um, electroencephalographic data, so EEG data, as well as fMRI data, so functional magnetic resonance imaging course. So you can imagine that without the solar component, this would be substantially a neuroimaging course in which students walk in with their own laptop and they, they get some data, they learn how to analyze the data, um, they, they have some lectures, so Xiaofu and I will be teaching them the common pipelines, how to analyze the data and so on. The major component is that while they are studying EEG, we will be recording their EEG signal meaning that we will have the 12 students um, um, kind of um, wear these portable EEG headsets, which uh, I completely agree with Brent. Um, these are very light, but having this very light uh, um, um, apparatus for 90 minutes starts being a little bit uncomfortable. So we have an eye on kind of the how, uh, how you know, this is going to affect or be detrimental for students learning. Anyway, so the main idea is use portable EEG headsets to study students' neural activity during our seminar. And students will be analyzing the same data that they just collected. So again, the circular activity of you study EEG, we explain you what EEG is, as we explain, we record your EEG signal, and then we give you your own data to analyze. So you're kind of really experiencing, um, um, you know, this circular approach. Uh, the research design has two components. The first one is kind of um, trying to um, study uh, 
who gets an A plus? What is uh, attention? Or what is the behavior of the students in the class? Um, so that we can really understand um, which are the attentional or physiological or behavioral markers of um, students' engagement and learning in class. And to do so, uh, we're going to compare um, participant performance in a control um, or students' attitude or students' engagement in a controlled classroom um, that we're also going to teach. So somehow you can imagine what a regular seminar is described here, which this is a instructor and pretty frontal environment versus our enhanced seminar here at the bottom, in which each student will have a um, EG headset. Most importantly, and this is this was uh, also uh, one of the biggest insights we got from Janet Metcalf is that we're going to record also visually video record uh, um, our students' behavior in class. So somehow we will have a real marker of um, not only neural marker but also objective video recordings of the student's behavior. So for example, uh, was Alfredo sitting here following the instructor as the instructor moves in the classroom or was Alfredo completely disengaged and you know, staring at the computer or at the phone and so on. So we expect to produce a very, very, very large uh, data set with neural marker, behavioral markers, subjective data because students will be rating their interest in the course and so on. And uh, also uh, video recordings in the attempt to understand really uh, who gets an A plus, what happens in the brain uh, and of our students that will, uh, what happens in the brain or what is the neural and behavioral um, markers, what are the neural and behavioral markers of a students that get an A plus versus a student that gets a C plus or a B plus and try to circle back their behavior in class during the semester with their final exams. We hope so, and we will let you know in fall as we start. Great, thank you so much, Alfredo. I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll move on to the general Q&A. But before we do, I just want to make one note. So probably many of you noticed how high tech both Brent's and Alfredo's projects are. Um, but I just want to be clear that Solaire is also very interested in rather low tech types of innovations in the classroom. I personally think it's really amazing to, to contemplate um, what can you do that really changes the student learning experience without any technology at all, right? So just through structuring different kinds of activities, through uh, emphasizing different modes of learning in the classroom, um, I think there's just as much to be learned in a very low tech kind of paradigm as there is in the high tech paradigm. So uh, if you're thinking more on the, in, in terms of low tech types of innovations, I encourage you uh, to, to feel like that, that that's valued just as much by Solaire as these rather, as these rather high tech paradigms are. Um, so we're gonna move on to a general Q and A. And I think that um, Sandesh and Merle will, will um, sort of moderate the Q and A and your questions can be for, for me or for Brent or for Alfredo. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. So we, we welcome your questions. And, and first of all, thank you so much for your attendance and your attention today. Looking forward to uh, interacting with many of you in the future. And uh, we're, we invite your questions now. Just to say while we're waiting for the question about the low tech, uh, yeah, one of the earlier studies we did was just having students answer questions in a group and discuss it or individually, and then take a test as individuals. And we found that students were answering a question as a group later perform better on the exact same test as individuals. And so now I always have them do group work in class because of that. And one of the next questions I'd love when I have a good time is to figure out why, what is it about the group work that improved their learning in the, as individuals later on? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brent. That's, that's a great example of this sort of conceptual innovation, um, structural innovation rather than a technological one, just as important uh, in, in the work that we're trying to do here. Hi, this is Wayne from the Stats Department. Um, I have a question about, does the topic have to span an entire course or can it just be a new way to teach a particular topic? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, so thank you for your question. Um, that, uh, yes, it could be, there are many different ways to structure one of these projects. It certainly could focus on one particular module of the course um, rather than spanning the entire course. Any kind of you know, research focused approach to a question about the student learning experience um, is, a, is a valid basis for an application. So certainly it's, it's a, a great idea to focus on one particular course module or unit or, uh, or component. And I, I'll just add to that, that one of the things that Adam and I have talked about is that, you know, everyone as researchers, we all have a tendency, like, you want to change the world with every experiment, but, and then sometimes that inhibits you from actually getting to, to do something. So just small incremental changes accumulated over many years, like if, if every year, every semester, you do one sort of incremental thing, in five years, you know, your course may be unrecognizable, but um, it's, it's not so hard to get there. Well, I know from my own teaching experience that uh, one of the hallmarks of good teaching is you have to be able to tolerate silence at times. So, so, so I'll give you all some time to think uh, about, about questions that you might have. Adam, if I wanted to have a project for the fall, when would be the ideal time to apply by? Oh yes, a great a great question and something that we we should have pointed out. Uh, we're we're using a rolling deadline uh, system here, but we are hoping to uh, have uh, awarded all of our projects by the end of the fiscal year, the end of June. So if you have a project in mind for the fall, um, it would be great to get that application in next month. Um, then the review process will happen. Um, the award would go out in June, and then we would start working on the research design and all of the preparation um, throughout the summer in time for implementing the projects uh, in the fall semester. Good question, Meryl. Thank you. Adam, there's some questions, or there's one question from Melissa in the chat. Any general advice for applicants about approaching the proposal? So the biggest piece of advice I can give you uh, for, for applicants is to schedule a consultation with Solaire because we very much want this to be a collaborative process. We know that faculty have a lot on their plates and that also the process of talking through um, their ideas with the Solaire team is, is a really fruitful and productive one. So the number one piece of advice is to get in touch, schedule a consultation, we'll talk through everything. And like I said, we can approach it as, as a collaborative process with a lot of support, even already beginning at the, at the application stage, because we want to be working with faculty to develop these ideas. Yeah, that's a good point, because we, we had an iterative back and forth as we thought about this what would fit, what, what could we do with Solar versus the Provost technology, Emerging Technologies Fund. So uh, that wouldn't, you don't have to sort of ship it off into the ether, but you know, just have a, have an iterative dialogue about what you want to do. And then Adam, another question from the chat from Maurice. Can you say a little more about the analytics dashboard for Canvas? I saw mention of that in the slides. Yeah, so this is an exciting project that Solaire is working on in collaboration with CUIT and the Academic Technologies Leadership Group. Again, the idea is to develop a tool that will make sense of this you know, huge amount of data that's generated by student engagement with Canvas and with tools like Panopto um, so that faculty will be able to kind of quickly get insights into their students' behavior. Um, because right now it's a little bit opaque, right? There are ways to, to generate reports through these platforms, um, but it's not so easy to do. And sometimes they're incomplete. Uh, sometimes they're not easy ways to um, filter or slice the data. So we wanna create a, a sort of workflow and a dashboard that will facilitate this process. And then faculty will be able to get insights, for example, into um, who's struggling in a particular course, say, um, you know, about individual students or about sort of general stats on, 
our students downloading the the reading PDFs, you know, in the case of a of like a digital engagement, um, or our students um, completing quizzes and stuff like that. A lot of that stuff, you know, there are ways to generate it, but we want to develop a system that will streamline the process and then also um, do so in a way that will relate to particular goals in individual courses. So it's sort of a general tool, but also will have some, some elements that will focus on the needs of particular faculty or of particular departments. So I know that was a little bit vague, but it is, it is just kind of at the very early stages right now and uh, something that we're gonna be developing over the summer and hope to kind of have some uh, sort of test runs with in the coming academic year. Adam, if I can just follow up on that. I was connecting it also to the presentation that Roxanne did on her use of data in her public yes. health uh, research. And it seemed like the difficulty was manipulating and getting all of that data. So the plan here is to allow something like what she was doing in a much simpler and really make it more accessible to everybody else. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so I want to highlight the work of, of Roxanne Russell in the Mailman School of Public Health, um, who's also part of this collaboration. Um, and again, the idea is to, to facilitate the process through which faculty can access data that's generated by student engagement with these platforms and then use it in, in important ways, you know, to either um, get insights into how students are doing um, or even to refine the design of the course, right, to, to use data as uh, as a basis for evidence-based changes to the to the structure of the design of the course or you know the timing of different assignments throughout the semester and stuff like that and i'm assuming this would also facilitate a b testing and things like that yeah exactly right so so you know earlier i talked about the idea of the experimental model kind of that a b testing and learning analytics but really one of the most exciting things happens at the intersection of those two right so you know uh not just the this amount of data that's generated through students using these platforms but what if we implement uh manipulations to elements of the student experience and then we have combining the experimental approach with the learning analytics approach that's something that i think we'll certainly be doing um, in the future Adam Shui from CBN. I have a question for you, um, but thank you so much for everyone's presentation. Very informative. And um, number one is that um, uh, from our office, we have managed a lot of MOOC courses. So we have a lot of online MOOC data. I'm just wondering that if uh, we are interested in applying for a research grant, um, what is the criteria to be a PI? Does um, do we need to uh, find a professor to collaborate with? So thanks, Shui. That's a that's a great question. It's something that we're still kind of refining our ideas about. At this time, we're thinking of the faculty PIs as uh, full time faculty, uh, either tenure track or non tenure track. Um, but I think as we sort of expand. Um, our conception of, of the work that Solaire does, like in terms of developing this data dashboard, for example, um, I think there'll be opportunities to get other types of administrative staff as PIs on these grants. So I would say if you have an idea about it, be in touch, and that's something that we can, we can develop collaboratively. Thank awesome. you. I think a, a, a follow-up question is that, what is the um, uh, uh, budget of, of the grant uh, can be applied to. So just would you be mind to give a little bit idea about that? Any restrictions or? So the question is what, what can the money be allocated for? What kinds of expenses? So usually we're thinking that it would be allocated towards equipment, um, towards software licenses, towards um, in some cases hiring research assistants. So I mentioned the Solar Fellows, but if there's also a need to bring in additional personnel like student research assistants, the funding can go towards paying them, um, can also go towards conference registration fees. Um, and th those would probably be the, the major categories. So thank you so much, everyone. It's one o'clock, so I think we will wrap up. But again, the uh, most important takeaway I hope is that please be in touch. Um, we really wanna connect with faculty, with administrative uh, folks um, to, to talk more about Solaire, to talk about project ideas. 
Solaria is still in its early stages, but hopefully it's, you, you can tell that we've, we've done a lot of good work already and we have um, a lot of aspirations for continuing to develop in the future. But that development, again, uh, depends in large part on our ability to connect with um, all of the other uh, people at Columbia, faculty and administration. So we really look forward to those partnerships. And uh, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about, a lot to be enthusiastic about coming up in the next academic year.